Let's have a word of prayer before we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for another Sabbath day. Thank you that we can come together and worship, sing beautiful songs, and listen to your word and fellowship. I just ask that you bless each person here, Lord. You know, you know our different backgrounds. We have different preferences and different desires. And but Lord, when we come together publicly, we know that we exist, we function we operate for the community. It's not about us. We set aside our differences, our personal preferences, and we come here to focus on the community, those we desire to reach. And Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for a church body that is willing to do that. And I ask that you bless our service today, the remainder of our service, and the rest of the Sabbath day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you know, we've been going through this series called Christian. We're just trying to understand what it means to be a, a Christian. And uh, we learned in the first Sabbath as we started talking about this that this idea, this name Christian was actually used by those outside the faith that was actually uh, used to uh, sometimes mock these group of believers. And the name that they used for themselves was the word disciples. They were disciples. And the word disciples, the term disciples is more defined, more specific you know what you're required when you hear that, ter- that name, disciple. In Christian, it's more of, a, more of a general, broad term, and you can do a lot of things. You can hide a lot under the guise of Christianity. People have done some awful things under that name. And as we continue to learn, we learned about different uh, interaction Christ had with his disciples, and we came across this passage quite a bit at the beginning, and we continued to look at this passage as Christ here in his last few moments with his disciples, and we find him there in the upper room, and he's, he's uh, wanting to show his love to them. He spent all these, all these uh, weeks and months and years with them showing love. He's healing. He's tending to their need. He knows their hearts. He knows all the things that they've been through, and he accepted them. He embraced them. He saw that text collector, that sheet, and he saw this person and that person. Listen, I still want to love you. I still want to accept you, ask you to be part of my, my group here. And so he's finally here in this upper room. And as we understand, the custom was that the servant would go and wash the feet of all the guests that attended there. And Christ does something crazy. He goes and takes off his outer coat and grabs a towel and starts to wash, humbly wash his disciples' feet. All of them, the good and the bad, Judas, and started to show his love and humility once again, and demonstrating all this. And as this is taking place, he's take, breaking bread with them, he's washing their feet. And Judas, all the while, is thinking about what he's about to do. He's about to betray his master. And he walks out that room, and just shortly after he walks out, Christ says this to his disciples. He says, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. If we just heard of that, love one another, said, listen, we've talked about love our whole lives. We know it's good to love. But he says more than just that. So that we can't just brush it aside, say, yeah, yeah, I love. I heard this whole love thing, love and peace and all that. But he says, love one another as I have loved you. You must love one another. And that requires a whole different level of love because if we think about it, if you think about it, and I encourage you to do this, sit down this afternoon or sometime, if you haven't done this in a while, or maybe you've never done this, but sit down, get a notebook, get something, and just look at your life. In those moments, the moments leading up to when you finally gave, when you broke, broke down and gave your heart to the Lord. And then, since that time, the struggle, the trials, all the different things, look at those different occasions and how God demonstrated His love towards you. When you wanted to go and do your own thing, He said, no, no, I want you to come back here. When you wanted to make this decision, when you wanted to do that, you even possibly thought of ending your life, and He said, no, I have better plans for you. Time and time again, demonstrated His love, His patience, His mercy, and working and working. And I'm the first to confess, I am a stubborn, hard-headed rebellious person. And God is patient. If I think about that love, think about that love that He has shown me. Whew. 
that brings me to a whole other level of love towards my brothers and sisters. Amen. And not just my brothers and sisters, not just you guys, but the people out there. The strangers, those that even hate me, my enemies. So listen, the same way that I have loved you, that love that I have demonstrated personally towards you, go and show that to others. It's a, it's a serious requirement. It's a little more than just casual love. You know, if you think about your life, there have probably been two different categories of people that have influenced your life profoundly. You think about this and you say, okay, I've, I've had some ups and some downs, and, and you're looking at your whole life. I believe you've been influenced by these two different categories, and it's those who've hurt you, those who've hurt you, and those who've loved you. Think about that. Those who've hurt you and those who have loved you. You look at everything in your life, the things that really impact you, that really change and made you what you are today. It's those people that broke you down, that were so mean, so hurtful to you, and you would go home and say, oh, I'm a different person because of what you made me, of what you said about me, what you did to me. On the other hand, you have the people that were there to pick you up. People that were there to embrace you, to show you unconditional love. Those that love you, they impact you, they change your life for the better. Those that hurt you and those that loved you. You know, the way you've been treated, it says there has more to do with who you are than what you, than what you believe. If you think about it, actually most people, they go to these therapists and they, they look at those two categories. Okay, where, where have you been shown love and where have you been hurt the most? They look at those things, they try to understand, okay, you've been hurt because of this in your childhood, this and this and things. How about the good? Let's look at the good where someone was there to come for you, this, this parent and this uncle and so forth were there to support you. So they look at those categories you might come to this conclusion, the way you've been treated has more to do with who you are than what you believe. And we're not trying to downplay belief. But what good is theory? What good is belief? If there's no action, right? You look at a lot of people, there have been some good people. Let me rephrase that. There have been some people that had, their, had good theology. Some people that knew their Bible, they could quote scriptures. They may have even been a pastor, an elder, and they've hurt a lot of people. Some of them are even sitting in jail today because they've hurt young children. And they would preach every Sabbath. They had their theology right. They understood the Bible They had a theory, but the practice was a different story. And they hurt these children. They hurt individuals. And they're behind bars today. And this person that's been marred, has been scarred for the rest of their life because of this man you think, or this woman, you think they care for one moment what they believe? What do you think matters most to them? What they believe or what they did? It's what they did. Because so what if you have your theology? So what if you claim to be this and that and you have a whole different practice going on? The way you've been treated has more to do with who you are than what you believe. Oh, Jesus' words are so important. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love, must love one another. The disciples understood this early on. They tried to put this to practice. It was simple. And they try to implement this. Okay, we're, we've shown us this tremendous love. We want to show this to those around us. And they showed, revealed action, love and action. But at some point there began to be this, this shift from the behavior, from the things that you do to what you believe. And then the things that you believe became more important at some point than the things that you actually, that you actually did. The church started to change And sure, doctrines and teachings and all those different things took the place of action. It was okay if you did those things behind the scenes in the dark, as long as you had the right teaching. You held to a certain certain creed, perhaps. 
No, Jesus didn't say, a new command I give you, believe correctly. By this all men will know that you're my disciples. If you believe correctly, they'll know you're my disciples. We need more than just believing some teachings. We asked this question last week, what does love, what does love require of me? This is a difficult question, but as the disciples, as they listened to Christ's teachings, as they wanted to put these things to practice, it's important for them to keep that in mind. When Christ says, when Christ says, they will know you're my disciples if you love one another. When he says, a new commandment I give to you to love. When he says that the greatest commandment is to love God and also love man, and everything falls under these things. What he's saying is, listen, regardless of any, and it's not just the Ten Commandments, it's not the 600 plus or so forth, and it's every teaching, every single teaching, whenever you approach that teaching, you need to ask yourself, how does love play into this? Look at that through the lens of love, and then you'll be able to carry it out accurately. Too often we want to just hold to some teaching, some practice, some law, and we want to implement the thing without ever considering love. What would love require of me in this situation? I hope you've been practicing this with your friends and family, the spouse when you're just there and they're really getting under, under your skin. They've just been nagging all morning. Just complaining about this and that, about the, this and that. <laughs> and, uh, and you want to retaliate. Hope you're asking the question. I need to remind myself to ask the question, what would love have me to do? What would love require of me in this situation? As a believer, as a Christ follower that wants to love God and man, what would love require me to do? With that coworker, with that stranger even in the street, with that person that just cut you off in traffic? Ask this question. I know it... it Sometimes we get, we get so, we move ahead of ourselves and we're derailed before we even know it. We're like, where, where did I go wrong? How did this happen? But even those few seconds, we always have those few seconds where we make the decision whether to go this way or the other. Ask yourself that question even in those few seconds. Walk out of the room if you have to. Whatever you have to do, stop your car. So what would love require me to do? Take some deep breath, say a prayer, and you can move on with your day. As Christ put this to practice, as I mentioned, he spent so much time with individuals. He demonstrated this love. Christ, like no one else, understood the story behind the symptom. The story behind the symptom. There, so often we see people, we see people, and you see the symptoms, right? We see this mess, we see this nagging, this annoying, this person that you haven't seen them smile in 10 years. You see all these different things. You're like, what is wrong with that person? They're so mean. They're so awful. Nothing positive comes out of their mouth. But you know, it's important to uh, be willing to look for it and listen to the story behind this. And, and, you know, Christ, he, he just had this insight. He knew people's hearts. And so he was always working with that premise. He was always responding to people, interacting with them, knowing what happened, why they were the way that they were. That's why he could go to a prostitute and treat her the way that he treated her. And not just judge her for what she was at that time, because he knew her heart. He understood the background story, what led her to that practice. I know we may not always have that insight, but we need to be willing to try. It's like that story, and you've heard the story before of, of that of, person that was on the bus and they're just trying to get somewhere and all of a sudden it's just so loud on the bus. These kids running around and they're ringing that bell. If you guys have been in the city, the CTA in Chicago, you ring the bell for, maybe now it's a buzzer, I don't know. I haven't been to the bus in a while. But for each stop, you know, and you're ringing the bell and you're jumping over the seats and you're just making this mess and they're throwing things back and forth. This person is getting so frustrated because the dad is just sitting there looking out the window, ignoring his own kids being an awful father. And so, you know, the person says, I need to do something. I'm just tired of this person. So many irresponsible parents out there. And he goes to this person and says, hey, can't you get your kids in order? What's wrong with you? Look over here, looking out the window, minding your business, and they're causing havoc here in the bus. Why can't you be a better parent and so forth? And he just lays it on him. And the dad says, you know, I'm so sorry. I didn't even, my mind is just elsewhere. I didn't even realize it was so noisy. I'm just here thinking about what just happened. Just came back from the hospital. My wife just died. And the kids were there, and they witnessed their mother die. 
And I don't know if they know how to react. And so they're acting wild and they're doing this and that. They're finding a way to numb themselves, to distract themselves. And I'm here thinking about that whole thing and what I'm going to do now, how I'm going to raise these kids. And he didn't even notice. And it's interesting how you go from looking at this guy, wow, this irresponsible parent, this careless individual. Don't you have any manners? Don't you care about the people in society? Don't you care about the public? All of a sudden you're like, wow, I'm the jerk. I'm the mean one. How, how dare I even judge? I, I don't even know what I would do if I was in that situation. I'd probably be sobbing on the, on the waiting room floor there still. And everything completely changes when you see the story behind what's, what's going on. It's important for us to be willing to do that, to examine that. To, and you may not always get all the details, but be willing to listen to the story before you judge people, before you jump to conclusions. As you do that, like Christ, you'll be able to love them like no one else has. As we desire to impact people and change our world for the better, and demonstrate this love in the same way that you've been, you've been hurt by people. If it's a group of people that have hurt you, you also have this other group of people that have loved you. When we desire to change, change the world, we can end up doing the same thing. How we interact with people, how we address these situations on a daily basis, we can either be hurting people deeply, hurting people deeply, or loving people profoundly. It's important for us to consider that. This isn't just something to say, well, I just insulted someone, no big deal, and it moved on. We are doing things that will impact people for the rest of their lives because you know how you've been impacted. You know the things, those, those things that hurt you and have scarred you, and you also know that love that was shown to you that has made all the difference. The reason you're still alive today, the reason you still get up every morning and are still going, because the love that has been shown you, first of all, from God and from those around you that support you. As you think about that, I want you to consider some three guidelines. Think about the people in your life, how you want to impact them, how you want to demonstrate this love. I want you to keep this in mind. First of all, don't do anything that will hurt you. We're trying to show love, demonstrate love, be love to people. Don't do anything that will hurt you. And this seems like kind of a selfish one, but why is this important? Don't do anything that will hurt you. When you hurt yourself, is it only you that hurts? When I hurt myself, when I do something that hurts me, you think my wife hurts also? You think my kids hurt? My friends, my family? Don't do anything that will hurt you. So many people don't even think about that when they commit suicide, when they think about ending their lives, when they make these careless choices, hurt themselves, they don't realize how many people they're hurting. First of all, don't do anything that will hurt you. Second of all, don't do anything that will hurt, that will hurt someone else. Think about the things, and I know that we make mistakes, we do things without thinking carelessly and we hurt people, but go and, go and apologize. Try to sort it out. But when you're constantly, constantly hurting people, constantly doing that, not asking the question, what does love require of me? You're doing something to that person. Demonstrating a pattern in their life, and they will remember it for the rest of their lives. The third thing, don't be mastered by anything. Don't be mastered by anything. Of course, someone mentioned the other church... Of course, we need to be mastered by Christ, by God. This is speaking of those addictions, those things, that alcohol and the cigarettes, those different things that master us. Because when we are mastered by something, we are giving all our time, our attention, our energies to that, and that will interfere with the love that we have to give to our spouse, to our children, and to our community. That thing will take away from the love, from the time that God wants us to give to those around us. Don't be mastered by anything. As I mentioned before, the church began on the right path. It says there, when we leverage anything other than love, we lose, we lose our leverage. We began, we began with love. We began with love, and at some point we started to leverage power and control. We started to use other things when the church became part of an organized uh, government structure and all that. We started to realize we had other tools in our toolbox. 
but not necessarily the things that God wanted us to use from the beginning. It's important for us to use the thing that God initiated at the start. This whole thing began with love, and we need to continue. We need to continue using love. It's interesting if you look at Conflict of the Ages series. Begins with patriarchs and prophets, ends with the great controversy. First few words, God is love. Last few words, great controversy, God is love. It's all about love. Everything that God has ever done, everything that Christ has ever done, everything is motivated and, and, and grounded on love. And we hear something like that that's just too simple for us. You know, as I was looking at this last night, I was thinking about these different thoughts, these different ideas, and I, I had this phrase just popped in my mind, and this is a, a phrase that will make a lot of you uncomfortable. The phrase was, love is enough. Love is enough. And you hear something like that, you're ready, your ears already perked up, you already got a little defensive maybe, because you, perhaps you think love is not enough. Us as humans, whenever we make a statement and we don't, we don't give specifics, we always want to qualify the statement. It's like us saying, well, listen, Christ's atonement on the cross is sufficient. There's nothing I can do to be saved. And we, we get uncomfortable, you know, it's like where someone's holding our breath. But, listen, whenever you throw in but, you negate everything you just said prior to that. There's nothing I can do to be saved. But you have to work. You have to listen. Either there's nothing you can do to be saved or there is something you can do to be saved. You can't have it both ways. Right? I believe love is enough. As Adam, the first thing we say, yes, yes, but the Bible says if you love me, do what? There you go. So is that describing what love is? Is that describing what a person that has genuine love in their heart? If a person has genuine love in their heart, you think they're going to keep God's commandments? If they have a genuine experience, but we always feel compelled to qualify, to clarify, why can't we just say love is enough? Why can't we just say Christ's atonement on the cross was sufficient, period? Why can't we say there's nothing we can do to be saved, period? We know what that looks like. We understand what that looks like. A person that is being saved will reveal certain things about their their life, in their life, right? But we always, because we're so scared that people will misunderstand, that they're going to get the wrong idea, that they may just hold on to that concept. And that's too scary for us. As parents, as teachers and leaders, we want to always, we have to qualify that thing. Because that's going to be a runaway train. Before they know it, they're going to think anybody can go to heaven and it doesn't matter what you live like. I'm okay with a little bit of mess. I'm okay with people not knowing exactly, exactly what that means. Because in my heart, I believe that Christ's love is enough. I believe that Christ's love demonstrated to me personally will produce something that nothing else can. Because I tell you what, I can go and keep the commandments. I can go and keep 2,000 different laws, 2,000 different rules, and not have love, one ounce of love in my heart. But I believe genuine love will produce everything that God wants to produce. Not man, not a church. I believe love is enough. If you look at this passage, once again, we think about our community, we think about those that we want to reach I desperately, I desperately hope that people can look at us. Regardless of what we believe, regardless of what, what we teach, regardless of what they know about us, outside of this one thing, I hope, I hope that they can know we are Christ's disciples because we love one another. At the end of the day, who cares what you believe? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter any of that. If you don't have love, it's all completely and utterly pointless. And that person out there that's hurting, that person that's desiring something, they don't care about the Sabbath. 
as wonderful. I love the Sabbath. They don't care about healthful eating. They don't care about any of those things, about not lying, not cheating. They don't care about that. But guess what? When you love them, when you love them, you're going to touch a chord in their heart. You're going to connect with them like nothing else can. And this is what Christ did. Christ would go about connecting through that love, showing love like no parent, no husband, no wife, no child had ever shown that individual. Showing that love. And after that, was, after that took place, it was all open. It was all fair game. So, okay, listen, you've shown me something I've never experienced before. I want everything you have to offer. We need to begin on the right foot. We need to begin, begin with love. If we begin with love, I believe God will he'll, he'll amaze us completely. He'll show us things. He'll impact people. People will start asking questions that we didn't lead them into. Asking questions about the Sabbath. Asking questions about this. I see something about you. I notice you worship on this day. You know, you have so much love for one another. You have so much love towards me. I want to be just like you. I want to worship on the same day that you worship on. I want to keep those rules that you keep, not because, just for rules sake, but because I know that it's done wonders for you. I know that your experience, that love that you have, that connection, that whole concept of your Christian experience has done so much for you, and I want part of that also. I hope and I pray this is your desire this morning. As we go to work, as we go to school, as people see us, I hope that they can say, that's, that's a disciple of Christ right there. Because I see love in their life. Amen? God bless you.